Hello and welcome. I'm Naina Bajakal, Times Deputy International Editor and Editorial Director of Newsroom Development. It's a pleasure to be with you to celebrate International Women's Day. Joining us today is a woman who epitomizes grace. Like the diamonds in her iconic brooches, she has endured great pressure from all sides and has shone brilliantly with her wise jurisprudence and her defense of the rule of law. She has broken countless barriers. She was first in her class at Cambridge. She turned in the top performance in her bar finals. She was the first woman and the youngest person appointed to the Law Commission. She was Britain's first female law lord, and she became the first woman on the UK Supreme Court, as well as the first woman to serve as its president. She recently retired from the court after groundbreaking decisions on Brexit, immigration, and domestic violence. She has transformed the art of the possible for women and children in the United Kingdom by making the choice to challenge. I'm pleased to be joined by Baroness Brenda Hale. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for asking me. Um, I want to start by taking us back a little bit to the Brexit ruling that made you known around the world. In September 2019, you ruled that it was not within the power of Prime Minister Boris Johnson to suspend Parliament for an extended period of time at such a critical moment. This was perhaps your most famous ruling. Do you believe it was your most important? It was important in one sense, obviously, because it interpreted the proper relationship between the government and parliament and to some extent the courts in the constitution of the United Kingdom. So that's a big deal. But in terms of its long-term impact on everyday people's lives, I don't think it's anything like as important as some of the other decisions about women's rights, children's rights, equality, uh, and so on, uh, which have got a lasting impact. Can you talk a bit more about those decisions? You know, what was what were the ones that you felt have had the most lasting impact? Well, there are several, so I don't want to talk about too many decisions. That would be uh, boring for a start. <laughs> but uh, there is one decision of the Supreme Court in which we said that violence was not limited to hitting or threatening to hit, but could include a much wider range of abusive harmful behaviour, what we would now call coercive control. So that was quite groundbreaking when we decided it. And it was a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court. Another one that I am very pleased about, another unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, is when we decided that the government should give first priority to the interests of children when they were going to be affected by a decision to deport or remove their parents. It's not the children's fault that their parents uh, have a dodgy immigration status. Uh, and these were British citizen children who, if their mother was removed, uh, they would have to go too, and their whole lives would be completely transformed and disrupted. Uh, and so we said that the government had to make their interests a first, not necessarily an overriding priority, but they had to think about them carefully. And they did, and the children stayed. Um, you mentioned that both of those were unanimous decisions. And was, was there a point at which you kind of led the conversation towards it becoming unanimous? Were there things that, certain things you brought to the table in those discussions? Do you know, I cannot remember whether there was. Most of our discussions are dominated by the arguments with which we have been presented by the government. Uh, and in the violence case, this was a dispute between a woman who wanted to be housed as a homeless person and the local authority whose obligation it was to house her. The government intervened on her side to argue for the wider definition of violence, which is interesting, isn't it? And in the immigration case, although the government um, resisted the principle, they actually did agree that in the particular case, those children should not be removed. So often the argument decides itself as a result of what you've heard in the courtroom uh, in front of you. I think that relationship between the, um, between the government and the Supreme Court is worth Kind of explaining a little bit for the audience. I know from working for an American publication that in the US, the kind of politics of the Supreme Court justices are much more front and center. They factor into nomination, confirmation, and rulings. What's the relationship like in the British court and how does it differ? Well, I can honestly say 
that I do not know the party politics of my fellow justices. In one or two cases, I can make a very good yes. Uh, and I'm almost certainly right. But in most cases, I don't. Uh, because their politics do not come into their appointment. The appointments used to be done by the Lord Chancellor, who was a senior member of the government. Uh, but he went on uh, standing in the legal profession and the sort of qualities you need to be a Supreme Court justice, rather than on party politics. I had four judicial appointments uh, before the Supreme Court. After that, one has to apply, and it's not done by the Lord Chancellor. But those four, two of them were by Conservative Lord Chancellors, and two of them were by Labour Lord Chancellors. So I think I could honestly say politics doesn't come into it. And, and with that particular famous decision um, around Brexit, you know, the context for that particular decision was intensely political. Did that influence you at all? How much attention did you pay to what was going on kind of in the wider media context at the time? <laughs> well, we didn't pay any attention to what was going on in the wider media context. We were far too busy paying attention to uh, all the documents that we had to read, all the arguments that we had to listen to in court and working out what the proper answer was. Uh, far too busy uh, to do that, to bother with what the media was saying about it. Um, I think there is a kind of common perception or misperception that the law is simply the law. It shouldn't matter who's interpreting it. Um, as someone who's said there should be more diversity on the bench, can you explain why that's important? You know, if the law is just the law, why does it matter who's interpreting it? Well, if the law were just the law, that, that would, of course, mean there was no need to interpret it because it would be obvious <laughs> what it was. And there are some laws that are perfectly plain and clear. Uh, I mean, the speed limit uh, in most towns in the UK is 30 miles an hour. That's absolutely clear. And if you go 33 miles an hour, you're breaking the law. But there are many laws which are not as clear as all of that. In the Supreme Court, we only hear cases which raise an arguable point of law of general public importance. And that, by definition, means that there are two sides, if not three, four or five sides to the argument, and there are choices to be made. And when there are choices to be made by a collegiate body, you know, more than one person, well, then it matters that a range of backgrounds and experiences and perspectives and legal philosophies that should be brought to bear on that problem, because then you're likely to get a better answer a more convincing answer, one that persuades more people. In, in terms of your own experiences, you know, getting to where you got to in the legal world, um, how has your gender informed those experiences? What was it like coming to the top? What was it like? Well, of course, when I started out, I am very old, you see, uh, and so I started out in the 1960s uh, as a law student uh, and then a law teacher and a baby barrister. And at that stage, there were very few women in the law. Uh, I think there were six of us in my year and more than 100 men uh, at Cambridge studying law. And there were hardly any women uh, barristers and solicitors. And the first woman High Court judge was appointed while I was a law student. So you could see that, uh, yes, we were a small minority. Uh, but in a way, that was becoming an embarrassment to the powers that be. They realized uh, that you know, women are half the human race. More and more of them were studying law. More and more of them ought to be getting uh, the big jobs in the law. So I don't think that my gender was actually much of a disadvantage to me. It might even have been a bit of an advantage, but say it not. <laughs> That's an improper consideration. <laughs> and, and in terms of what it looks like now, I think you know it's much more equal in terms of who's studying law, what does it look like at the kind of higher levels in the legal world practicing? Well, like most other professions, there is an attrition. You know, there are fewer women at the top of the profession, in the senior ranks of the profession, whether you're talking about solicitors, barristers or judges, than there are uh, lower down or the more junior ranks. Um, and there are many reasons for that, but one of them is that women 
quite often decide that they don't want to stay in the uh, self-employed practice of the law because of the demands that it places upon them, especially as barristers uh, and in the big solicitors' firms. Um, it's a very high-pressure existence. There are many, many other ways of putting your legal skills to good use, which don't have those pressures. And yet we assume that that's where they fish in order to get the judicial appointments, especially the top judicial appointments. Uh, so we have to attack that assumption about where to fish uh, and uh, get them to fish in uh, rather different and wider uh, ponds where there are still many very able women, uh, but they're working in a different way. They may be working for the government, they may be working for local authorities, they may be in other public sector areas such as regulation, or they may be in-house counsel in uh, a variety of, of uh, commerce, finance, and industry. Uh, and they're just as able as the women who are making stars of themselves uh, as advocates in court. And did, did you know that's where you wanted to end up? Did you have that kind of drive to be a star advocate in court? What was the, what kept you going? Um, <laughs> well, no, I, I never was a star advocate in court because I gave up being a barrister to concentrate on my academic career after only a few years. And that was mainly because it's easier to combine family life with being an academic than it is with being a barrister, especially the way the legal profession is organised uh, in the United Kingdom, with a division between the barristers who go to court and the solicitors who do the uh, preparation and handle the clients and all of that sort of thing. Um, so the trouble is the barristers have to be ready at the drop of a hat to uh, travel all over the place uh, and... Uh, often get their briefs rather late in the day, especially in certain types of work. Uh, so not very convenient, really. Whereas as an academic, I could um, arrange my teaching into two or three days a week and spend the rest of the time doing my research and writing uh, at home, which was much more convenient. And, and when you made the decision then to, to turn to academia, did you think you'd end up in the positions you ended up in ultimately? Absolutely not. <laughs> And it was a very big surprise. As, uh, why would I? Uh, I thought you know, I'll hope to become you know, a full professor and, and have a successful academic career. Never crossed my mind that I might have a successful judicial career. But after I'd been away from court for about 10 years, somebody in the Lord Chancellor's department, this is in the days when it was still done by the tap on the shoulder from the Lord Chancellor, uh, had the idea let's diversify the baby judiciary, uh, not by having more women, but by having a few academics with practitioner qualifications and experience. And so he asked me whether I'd like to become a baby judge. Um, and of course I said yes. Um, you were required to retire at age 75, um, keeping in mind that Ruth Bader Ginsburg served on the US Supreme Court until she died last year at age 87. Um, did you feel like your judicial career ended sooner than you would have liked, or were you ready for it to come to an end? I think I was entirely ready for it to come to an end. I'd been a full-time judge for 26 years and a part-time judge for eight or nine years before that. So that's quite a long time to be doing the judging job. Um, and I thought I would like to stand back a bit and look at doing other things, like more traveling, more conferences and speaking, more writing, uh, and just possibly to enjoy life a little bit more. Not that being a judge isn't very enjoyable, it is extremely enjoyable, but it is a very high pressure job and it is rather all consuming. It doesn't leave you a lot of time for other things. And so I wanted to do other things. And I also thought it was time for other people to get to be doing the job. What are the other things you have been doing since retiring? I mean, I'm sure the pandemic has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works. Well, I'm afraid the pandemic threw a, an enormous spanner in the works. Uh, I was due to spend a month sitting in the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong, and that didn't happen. I was due to go to the um, World Conference of the International Association of Women Judges in New Zealand. That didn't happen. It's happening virtually this year instead. Um, 
still don't get to go to New Zealand, which is a great shame because I love the place. Uh, there were many other foreign trips for conferences and the like, which also uh, were cancelled. Um, but bit by bit, you know, people started doing things virtually. And so quite a lot of the events have come back it, like this, often as a conversation rather than a lecture, uh, which I think is much easier for people to watch and more enjoyable. Uh, but I've done quite a few of these uh, and they're good for me. They get me um, at least interacting with other people rather than just interacting with myself and my desk and my screen. And uh, writing as well. Oh, yes. Yes, I have been writing. Um, I've been writing some lectures and I've got various contributions to, to books to write, but I have also been writing my own memoirs. And um, can you talk a bit about the title of your memoir? <laughs> well, we've decided we'll call it Spider Woman. I'm sure you can imagine why. <laughs> it might be worth explaining um, for the audience who might not know why uh, that's an, a particularly appropriate title for you. Yes, indeed. Well, um, when I delivered the summary of the Supreme Court's judgment in the prorogation case, the case that held that the Prime Minister had acted unlawfully when he advised Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament, that suspend Parliament for such a long time, at such a crucial time in the nation's history. I was wearing a rather sparkly spider brooch. Not diamonds, not real, um, but very sparkly. Uh, and somehow people latched onto that. I think they thought there was a hidden message in it which there wasn't, it was just the brooch that was on that dress. Um, but uh, it, it did catch on. A firm produced that very day a T-shirt uh, with a sparkly spider on the T-shirt, uh, which they uh, sold for charity. Uh, and uh, that seems to have gone down quite well. <laughs> so we thought we might call the book Spider Woman. And what's the brooch you're wearing today? Oh, today, this is a frog on a lily pad. Um, another present from my husband, who was very fond of giving me brooches. Um, so uh, it, this is one I'm particularly fond of. Um, and in terms of a different kind of design element, when you were appointed a law lord, you designed a coat of arms for yourself with the motto, women are equal to everything. Um, how did you intend that to be read? Is it an observation on your own life or an inspiration to other women? Is it both? It's both, of course. Um, normally, of course, the motto that you have on a coat of arms is really supposed to be the family motto. It's about the family and who they are and what they believe in. So principally, it was about what I believed in, that women are equal to anything and everything. Um, but if other people um, take heart from that as a motto and think it's a good idea to believe it too, well then, that's great. Wonderful. Um, given all of that, there's no doubt you're a role model for other women. Did you have role models of your own? Yes, I'm sure um, we all do. Obviously, there weren't a lot of senior women in the law. Uh, my first role model was my mother, um, who qualified as a teacher in the 1930s, but had to give it up when she married my father. But then when my father died very suddenly, uh, when I was 13, she picked herself up, dusted herself down, uh, rolled up her sleeves and uh, became a teacher again herself. And so that was very much a, a model of determination and um, getting on with it, resilience in the face of what had been a huge shock and seemed to be a great uh, adversity. Uh, I'm sure that that is one of the things that made me determined to have a profession of my own and to be independent uh, and not to have to rely on other people uh, at any stage. So I think it's not only a motivation to go and study law and to have a career, but also a motivation to continue with that career even when I had my daughter. So, yes, number one role model, my mother. Um, but there were also people like Rose Heilbronn, who was a very famous barrister, 
practicing mainly in the north of England. During the 50s, she was probably the most famous barrister in England because she was very beautiful and very successful at defending murderers and, and the like. So she was on the front pages a lot of the time. Those were the days when the newspapers had verbatim accounts of what went on in famous cases. They don't do that anymore, which is a shame. <laughs> um, so she was quite a role model. Um, and, uh, and there were others as well you know, who I was quite often the second woman doing things. And so I was always grateful to the first for not pulling up the drawbridge and not frightening the horses. Um, in terms of that drawbridge, I mean, as someone who's broken so many barriers, what advice would you share with the kind of younger women coming up in the profession or younger women generally kind of looking for Younger women generally, yes, because I don't think the law is very different from other professions that women might want to go in for. There are the same structural problems uh, elsewhere and the same attrition rate and so on. So, number one piece of advice is to try and enjoy what you're doing, whether you're studying or whether you're starting out in your career. Because if you enjoy what you're doing, you're likely to work hard at it. Number two advice is to work hard at it and be the best you possibly can at whatever it is that you're doing now. Uh, and that is a circle. You know, if you enjoy it, you'll work hard and you'll do well. And if you don't enjoy it, you won't work hard and you won't do well. It follows really. And then, as I have done, if interesting opportunities come your way, grab them with both hands. Don't say, oh, don't think I can do that. Or I can only do half of that, so I won't do the job. Uh, if you could do half of it, you can do it. Uh, and so give it a go. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, don't worry about that. Something else will work out. But I think it's taking the opportunities as they come your way and making the best of them. So three pieces of advice. That's my uh, advice. Um, Lady Hale, thank you so much for joining us today to share your insights and experiences. I know I've learned a lot. It's been such an honor to speak with you. Uh, to our audience today, a reminder, the IWF celebration of International Women's Month continues with our virtual Cornerstone Conference on the 25th of March. We have a fantastic lineup of women experts who will share their knowledge on trade, disinformation, and the business of fashion. I'm Naina Bajekal from Time. Thank you.